but uh, it's good to be back. Um, 1999, the Healthy Choice Food Company came up with a um, they came up with a promotion. It was a big promotion. They told people they said if you turn in 10 barcodes from any of our foods, we will give you a thousand frequent flyer miles. This guy named David Phillips is a civil engineer out in California. He started doing all the math because he's kind of a math geek, and he figured out that a thousand frequent flyer miles was a much greater value than healthy foods pudding cans. So here's what he did. He went to every store that he could find where he lived. He bought up every single pudding can that he could. And of course, as he's at the registers, all these people are looking at him like, what are you doing? You're crazy. He had a great excuse. Y2K. He's like, I'm just saving up just in case Y2K hits. And so they were like, oh, that makes sense. So he ends up buying 12,150 cans of healthy choice pudding. He took every single one of those barcodes. He turned them into the company and the company said, no. They're like, we are not going to give you those frequent flyer miles. Well, after some persuasion, they decided they would do it. He ended up with those 12,150 cans. He ended up with 1.25 million frequent flyer miles. Now, some of you don't even care about that. You're like, what do you do with the pudding, right? <laughs> well, he didn't eat it. This was great. He actually gave it to food banks in the neighborhood there. In the end, he ended up spending $3,100 for 1.25 million frequent flyer miles, and he got an $800 tax deduction because of giving the pudding to these <laughs> banks. I'd say this guy did pretty well. But what was the deal with Phillips? Well, the deal's pretty simple. He figured out a loophole. He figured out there was this way that he could beat the system and get what he wanted out of it. Today, we're going to continue our series called Stories. We're looking at these parables, which are really stories that Jesus would tell that had these meanings behind them. And, and I know for us, we're 2,000 years removed from Jesus, and, and we think about that, and we're like, but that was for them then. But it seems like every single parable we've talked about so far, we see that it's still relevant to us today. And this morning, the topic we're going to talk about, the parable we're going to look at, it's one that you and I so often are looking for loopholes. And the reason is, we don't like this topic. And in fact, it is probably the worst F word that we know of, all right? It's the word forgiveness. Philip Yancey is an author, and he wrote these words. He said, forgiveness is an unnatural act. And if you struggle with forgiveness, you know how true this statement is. It is extremely hard for us to forgive. Forgiveness just doesn't come naturally for us. In fact, we're not any different than Phillips, are we? When it comes to forgiveness, you and I, we're looking for loopholes. Because in the end, we don't want to forgive. So this morning, let's start there. Let's start there with talking about forgiveness. And we're going to talk through a conversation that Jesus has with one of his disciples and what, he, and what Jesus has to say uh, about forgiveness. This comes out of the book of Matthew. We're going to spend um, all of our time there this morning. Matthew chapter 18, starting with verse 21, it says this. It says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Here's Peter who looks at Jesus and is like, hey, Jesus, um, what's the limit to the number of times that when someone hurts me that, that I can go to that I have to forgive them, but beyond that, I don't have to forgive them anymore? Now, in Jesus' day, the rabbis would teach there was a limit, and that limit was three, that you had to forgive somebody three times, and at the end of that, anything over three times, you didn't have to forgive them anymore. And some of you are like, maybe I'll become Jewish, because that actually sounds like a pretty good deal, right? But this is Peter. Peter's an overachiever, and I'll be honest with you, if you know much about Peter, I think he was a pain in the you-know-what to Jesus and so many other people, because Peter just thought differently, right? And so I think for Peter, when he's thinking about this, he's like, you know, I'm going to show off. I know what the rabbis teach. I know they talk about three, but I'm going to multiply that by two and then add one and come up with this number seven. Now, I've looked around. I don't see anywhere where that number seven was important in those days. Maybe you've got something else. It's just kind of like he arbitrarily picks the number seven and says, hey, you got to baptize or you got to forgive someone seven times before, you know, then you can pounce on them. 
Again, what's Peter doing? He's looking for loopholes. That's why he throws this number out there. How many times do I need to forgive them before I can fully go after them? While at the same time, maybe looking like I'm a little compassionate towards them. Well, here's how Jesus responds. Verse 21, excuse, uh, verse 22. It says, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, depending on the translation that you read of the Bible, and the Bible's in many different translations, you may see 77, or like here, you see this math problem, like 70 times seven. In the Greek, it can mean either one, okay? But that's actually not even important here. But it's not about this number that Jesus gives. This number that Jesus gives, his point is, forgiveness should be unlimited. The forgiveness should be unlimited. But again, like Peter, what are we looking for? We're looking for loopholes. Hey, Jesus, give me a number. Give me a number that I can count up every single time. And once I reach that, I'll forgive them that many times. But after that, I don't have to do this anymore. So Jesus decides to tell a story. Verse 23 says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Now a couple things to know here that um, when the Jewish parables, when you have a king that is being talked about, it's talking about God. When it talks uh, about here these accounts being brought up to date, it's talking about divine judgment. And so the story Jesus talks about here is about God, it's about humanity, it's about God's relationship with humanity and what that looks like. Now, um, another little piece to this, again, different translations of this particular story that Jesus tells. And so depending on which one you read, you might read about gold or silver, you might read about talents. Uh, here they put it in our vernacular, it's, it's using dollars, right? The number that Jesus uses here was the, the top number in the Greek system. You couldn't go any higher. And if we were to take that, that money then that he's talking about and, and put it in the context of today's financial currency, we're talking about a couple of billion dollars this guy owes back to this king. And the king comes and says, hey, I need you to pay those billions of dollars back. And the borrower says, I, I can't. Can you give me a little more time? Verse 27, then his master is filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. Here's a guy who literally has a hopeless amount of debt that he owns. He goes to the king and he's like, I can't do this right now. Give me some time. And the king is like, well, here's the deal. I'm just going to wipe the slate clean. You don't need to worry about paying it back. And we can read this part of the story and we think to ourselves, this is good, right? Like, I like this. This is about a king forgiving the debt. And it's, you know, it's God forgiving our, our debts. But of course, Jesus puts a little twist to the story. Verse 28, when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him, everything that had happened. Now think about this, this story here. Here's a guy who's just been forgiven billions of dollars. And what does he do? He goes to one of his servants that owes him a few thousand dollars. And that day and time, we're talking about three to four months worth of wages. And he goes to him, and how does he treat that servant? There's physical violence, right? It says he grabs him by the throat. He demands this repayment right then in that moment. Here's someone who has forgiven this huge debt, and yet he couldn't forgive a few thousand dollars that were owed him. And so he has a servant thrown into prison. Look at verse 32. Then the king called in the man who had for, he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. 
King finds out what this guy has done and he has him arrested. He brings him back. He's like, what are you doing? He's like, I forgave you all of this debt that, that you owed me. And, and now you go chasing after one of your servants for a few thousand dollars. Here's the king's like, I, I, can't, I can't believe, I can't believe you would do this. The story for Jesus is telling the listener that God forgives a lot, and a lot is the forgiveness that's given towards us. But there's another piece to this, but if you and I can't forgive others, no matter what that debt may be that we feel is owed us, like there's a repayment plan that we're not going to like a whole lot. You know, it's easy for us to hear the story and, and even to understand it, but you know what we look for? We still look for loopholes. We're still looking for ways that, that we can get away with not forgiving someone else. Because in our mind, we're kind of like Peter. It's like, I, I don't really need to forgive them because what they did to me was so bad. I, I don't need to forgive them because, you know what, they don't deserve it. I don't need to forgive them because here's what I need to do. I need to protect myself. And yet here's Jesus who tells this story and he's like, here's the deal. Peter, there are no loopholes. There, there's no way to get around this. I, I don't care what has been done to you. I don't, I don't care what, what it is that's happened to you. You must forgive them. And if you're a person who is looking for loopholes when it comes to something like forgiveness, I got bad news for you. There are none. There are no loopholes. However, I do believe there are steps that you and I can take that can move us towards forgiveness when it's tough. Because here's what I can tell you about forgiveness. There, there are different levels to forgiveness. There's easy forgiveness, right? Someone steals your pencil. Someone sits on your ice cream cone. I mean, it's an inconvenience, but pretty quickly we're like, all right, no problem at all. You know, just give me another ice cream cone. Give me another pencil, whatever. We're, we're good to go. We, we forgive them easily. But then there's those, those people that it's really, really hard to forgive. And, and how do you forgive those people when it's hard to forgive them for, for what they've done? And again, in our minds, we can say, I, I know Jesus says that I'm supposed to forgive them no matter what, but how can I forgive them when they walked out the door on our family? How can I forgive them when they took the life of someone I love? How can I forgive them when they abused me for so many years over and over again? How can I forgive someone when it's hard? When we want to be more like the borrower who went after his servant, that's what we want to do, right? We, we want to hurt that other person who hurt us. And yet Jesus says, hey, look, here's the deal. You are called to forgive but how do we do that? Now, we could go in many different directions when it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to this particular parable. But here's what I know. I know that there are many of us who struggle with forgiveness. And there are many of us that struggle with forgiveness because there's somebody in our life that's really, really hard to forgive. And so what I want to do over the next few moments, I, I want to talk about that. I, I want to talk about when it's hard to forgive someone in our life. How do we do this? And so, I, I mean, how do we do this in a healthy way for ourselves? How do we do this in a God-honoring way? And so um, today is going to be extremely par uh, practical for you, all right? So if you're here today and you're like, man, this is good for me, this is good for someone else, grab a piece of paper, write down some notes, get out your phone, put some notes on there, whatever, um, because this is going to be very, very practical. And here's what else I would tell you. These six steps I'm going to walk you through, I know these work because uh, they have worked with people I know and love and care about. And they have taken these steps, and they have been able to forgive, and I can tell you this incredible burden was just released from them. So I know these work. So take the time to write these down. But here we go. Six steps to working through when, when forgiveness can be so hard. Here's step number one. Acknowledge the past. When we struggle with forgiveness, it often comes from our experiences in the past, that someone at some time did something to us that we still carry. They're not even scars. They're still wounds. They are wounds that are still open in, in our soul and in our heart and inside of who we are. And here's what happens. Those wounds, they seep out. And how do we see them in our life? Bitterness, 
anger, negativity, hate, rage. And you know what that begins to do? It begins to influence every aspect of our life. It, it begins to influence our relationships. It influences our mental health, our physical well-being, our spiritual life, and just who we are day to day. And one of the first things that we can do to move towards forgiveness in our life is we've got to acknowledge that that past is there. But that then leads us to the second step here is write your story. A counselor will tell you that when you're struggling with forgiveness, a good starting point is to write down your story. You, you write down your experiences. You write down the facts. You, you write down your, your feelings. They, you don't hide from these things. You don't hide from the hurt. You don't hide from the pain. You express it through your words. And when you begin to express it through your words, you're going to start to see, you understand where that bitterness is coming from and anger and, and hate. And I will tell you this, to do this is hard. And it is painful. And it will take time. James Patterson is the only person I know who can write a book in two days, okay? Most authors take weeks, months, and years to write a book. This will take you time to get all of this out, preferably on paper, that you're writing this story out. And the reason you're taking this step is because you're looking for peace. You're looking for healing from what you've experienced. And this is a great way to do that. You acknowledge that past, and then you write that story. Which then leads us to step number three. Stop retelling the story. Lewis Smedes was a Christian author, and he wrote this in a book on forgiveness a few years back. It says, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover the prisoner was you. Hey, sometimes we're the prisoner in the story. We don't even think about it. We don't even understand, but we're the prisoner. We're stuck. We're imprisoned by our past, and that past has become this never-ending story, and you know what we do with it? We tell it over and over and over again to people in our lives. I mean, think about people you know right now in your life that when you look at them, you're like, man, they're bitter people. They're really angry. They're always negative. Why is there so much hate there? Well, th the truth is, you don't even have to ask yourself that question because you know why. Because they keep telling you their story over and over again. They keep retelling. And so you know exactly why they feel the way they feel and because of the past that they've had, because of those experiences in their life, you know them sometimes better than they do. But they feel like they're going to get peace and healing from retelling the story over and over again. But sometimes what we find is that we're actually prisoners to that story, and we become defined by that hurt. And we never find that healing. We just keep retelling. That, that word, actually, forgiveness, um, in the language Jesus spoke, which was Aramaic, it really means to divorce. It, it means to separate one's self. And for some of us, we are still married to that past. We are still fully connected to it. And, and we haven't divorced ourselves from it. We haven't set ourselves apart from it. And it has defined who we are today. And not only do you know your friends who are like this, but you have become defined in that same way. For us to be able to say those words, I forgive you, we acknowledge that past, we write the story, and the other thing we stop doing is we stop retelling the story over and over again. Which then leads us to step number four. Don't do this alone. Uh, I know when I, I talk about divorcing yourself from the story and stop talking about it, I don't mean to act like your past didn't happen. Uh, I, I don't mean just forget about it. I don't mean just move on. What I mean is stop, stop talking about it and begin to do something to find the healing that you need. But you got to know you cannot do this alone. You, you cannot move forward in that healing process without the help of others. Someone else who can be there to help you divorce yourself from, from that past. Someone that can be there with you on this healing journey. I, I love what Paul says in Galatians chapter two, verse uh, 6, verse 2. Very beginning, he says, share each other's burdens. Some translations say, 
carry each other's burdens. I, I love that because this is what needs to happen. That when you have this past that you are trying to divorce yourself from, that you're trying to find peace from, that you're trying to get to this place of forgiveness, you need someone with you that will help you on that journey. Now, it might be a friend. It might be a group of friends that you can confide in. That's a great step. Highly recommend counseling. Um, if you've been here at the journey at any length of time, we're going to talk about counseling all the time because we know it's important. We believe in it. We have seen it help over and over again. And I talk about our unique relationship with Safe Harbor Christian Counseling. Um, man, our, our whole family has been through Safe Harbor Christian Counseling. Uh, many of you have used their counselors. It's just a great way to help you in this process. Um, we would love to help you with this. Uh, you can email us, office at thejourneynova.org, office at thejourneynova.org, and we will connect you with Safe Harbor. So take the opportunity to do that. Email us. Here's the deal. People are like, yeah, I need to do that, but man, we can't, we can't afford to pay for it. That is never an excuse here at The Journey. Uh, we have budgeted money for the year, and we've done this over the past couple of years, for counseling. We had our Easter offering that we gave away, and $5,000 of that went to counseling here at The Journey. Um, we even have a couple of families here in the, at the church that said, if you've got families that cannot pay for it or an individual can't pay for it, we will pay for it for them, Okay. You have no excuses. If this is you and this is something you need to work through in this process you need to go on, there's nothing better than having those friends that you can confide in and can walk this journey with you, but having a professional help you take these steps in your life. Because forgiveness and moving past that past is going to take a long, long time. And you're going to need people that can share this burden and carry it with you. Which then leads us to step number five, be the hero of your story. Uh, if uh, I've heard this statement too many times, and if Snopes had a bad theology page, this would be on it. Here's what it is, and if you've, you've probably heard it. God allowed this to happen to you so something good can take place from it. Let me read that one more time. God allowed this to happen to you so something good can take place from it. For the most part, I don't know what's happened to you in your past. I don't know your experiences, but I can tell you this. God did not make those experiences in your life take place so that at some point in your life, something good can come from it. Here's what I will tell you happened. Someone terrible, someone evil hurt you. And for some, hurt you in, in horrible, horrible ways. But God did not let this happen to you in your life so that some good can come from it. Okay, it's horrible, terrible theology. But then there's that part of us that's like, well, hold up a second, but if I've got this hurt, can there actually be good that comes from it? Is it, is it possible to find some good in this, this pain and, and this hurt? And I think there is. Here's what we know about heroes. What do heroes do? They run. And they don't run away. They run towards the battle. They, they confront the offender. Now, not in the way that the guy in the story did, right? Even though that's the way we would love to respond in, in moments like this. What do heroes do? Well, heroes do and write their own story in this way. They get to this place where they are able to forgive. That's what a hero does. They forgive. In October 2006, in the Amish community of Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, Charles Roberts walks into this little Amish schoolhouse and shoots 10 of the girls in that class that day, killing five of these beautiful young ladies. In the Amish community, forgiveness is really central to their theology. And so here are the, this community, here are these, these families, here are these parents who have to grieve in this terrible time and, and they bury these, these beautiful young ladies that were killed. They worked through their funeral times, the grieving process, and there was a funeral for Charles Roberts, the gunman. And you know who shows up the day of the funeral? That Amish community, those Amish families. And you know what they do? They're not there to picket. They're not there holding up signs like, we hate you. They're not there to yell at the family as they're walking in and out of this funeral. They are there and they participate in this funeral for the man who killed their kids. 
at the end, they didn't just leave. They walked up to his widow and they hugged her. And every single one of them said this, that we forgive him for what he did. I don't know how many times I've read this story and every single time I get chills. So I'm like, who? Who responds in this way when something happens like that in your life? You know who does that? Heroes do. They run towards the offender. And no matter how hard it may be, and I can't even imagine what that would have been like, no matter how tough it was to do that, they knew the right thing to, to do in that moment and that day was to forgive him for what he had done. Again, I can't imagine that. That's why I think these words of Ephesians chapter 4 are so important. Paul says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. How do we become the hero of our story? How do we live this out towards someone that I know for, for many, it is really, really hard to do. Well, first, it starts with a lot of prayer. But you're asking for God to work in amazing ways to change your heart and how you feel towards this person. But, but it is all about getting to this place of where we show, like Jesus talks about here, we show mercy. As we see here with the Amish community, how we get to this place where we can, we can say, I forgive you. Which really goes back to step two when I told you about writing out your story. When you've had someone to walk along with you down this hard, long road, at some point, you have to send that letter. You have to write that email. you got to share that you remember and know about that past and what happened. And here are the facts and here's the feelings to this. Here's the hardest part. In the end, you write these words, I forgive you. You, you want to be the hero of the story? You want to be the hero of your story? You get to this place where you're willing to say, I forgive you. And you know what? That is the antithesis to everything that we want to do. We want to attack. We, we want to pounce. We want to slander. We want to do all that. We we, we want to hold on to this bitterness and this rage and this anger that's just so deep down inside of us. We're like Peter. We're still looking for loopholes, right? How do I get out of this? And yet we need to be more like this the Samish community. We need to be more like Paul talks about here. We, we need to be more like, like Jesus says here that, that we've got to be full of compassion and kindness and even love. And it comes when we can say those words, I forgive you. Which then leads us into the last step. It's to live a life of forgiveness. Um, I know for some of you, you, you're hearing this message today, and I, I know what you're thinking, what you'd say to me, hey, Chad, you just don't know what they, they did to me. You don't know the hurt that's there. I can't get over it. I'll, I'll never forget what, what they did. And I, I, I understand I, I, I get that. I've, I've heard those stories. I, I have lived it out with some family members. I, I know exactly what that's like when you're, you're thinking that. But here's what forgiveness doesn't mean. It doesn't mean you forget. It doesn't mean you forget what happened. Because you can't. It's still there. It also doesn't mean if you forgive them that they won. No, if I, honestly, if you get to the place of forgiving them, in the end, you, you are the winner. But here's the other thing it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean if you forgive them, you have to try to restore that relationship. Sometimes, probably often, the best thing that can happen is that you say, I forgive you, and that relationship, it just doesn't exist for you anymore. And that's okay, too. But in the end, we are called to forgive. And forgiveness means that we are moving towards healing. That we're letting go of our bitterness. We're letting go of our anger. We're letting go of this, this hate and this negativity. And here's what forgiveness does, too. It creates possibilities. Again, it goes back to the story. The, the, the king says, why can't you show mercy? I showed you mercy. Why can't you do that? It creates possibilities for us when we forgive to show mercy to someone. It gives us an opportunity to show grace. 
And in the end, it gets an opportunity to show love. Because that really is what forgiveness is. It's this unconditional love towards someone that I know is so hard to love. But Jesus says, no matter what, you are called to forgive. And we forgive. We forgive because we love. And the reason that we love is because God loved us. Like what John says in 1 John 4, he says, this is real love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. There are these incredible debts that this guy owed, billions of dollars to the king, and he's like, I'm so sorry, I I'll pay it back. And the king's like, no, you're forgiven. That's how much I love you. I care for you. I'm going to forgive you billions of dollars of debt. And yet that same person can't forgive the small debt that's owed him. Are we willing to be a people who can live a life of forgiveness? Again, it's not easy, especially if those wounds are deep. And that past is long. It's tough. It's hard. But Jesus says, no matter what, you and I, we are called to this life of forgiveness. And the reason is, you and I, we've been forgiven so much.